Roy, I want to ask you, obviously, I always call 2015 the year of immunotherapy in <laughs> lung cancer. It's, it was a banner year for, for us in lung cancer. But there's an increasing interest in, in this interplay between angiogenesis and immunotherapy. I wonder if we could get your thoughts on that. Right, so, so certainly I would agree with the others that angiogenesis clearly plays a role in all the tumor types we're discussing. Um, how much of a role uh, varies. You know, there, there's never been a really good marker uh, for angiogenesis, and it's a redundant process. There are many mechanisms. But, but it's receiving a new, new life in, in combination studies because with immunotherapy now being, you know, the, the molecule uh, of the year, you know, yeah. big focus at ASCO, last year, this year, the question is how can we make immunotherapy better? And one thought is that, you know, in order for checkpoint inhibitors to function, you both have to have the checkpoint in play and have the ability to inhibit that, but you also have to have T cells, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in the tumor. And one thing that's been found in a number of studies, including some that we've done, is that when you look at biopsies of patients who are not responding to some of these immunotherapies, you see that the T cells don't get to the tumor. Yeah. They're either not there at all, or you can oftentimes see a rim of cells that are not getting there. So one thought, and it's based on some very um, early preclinical data, uh, very hard to do these models, as you can imagine. You need to study you know, a, a mouse by its very nature that's growing a tumor. You make it immune incompetent, and then you want to test you know, the, the immune system. But there, there are data, and they're beginning to emerge, that some of these anti-angiogenic agents can actually help uh, the, the get the T cells to the tumor, either some of the matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors that might help break down the collagenase and, and get the, the, the T cells in, some of the anti-angiogenic agents like VEGF inhibitors. Uh, the same way they used to improve drug delivery um, by relieving uh, tension, uh, vascular tension within the tumor. Uh, it's very exciting now to think that we can now use some of these agents in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And there are trials ongoing right now uh, that several of us are participating in that I think um, will we'll have uh, very uh, nice, uh, nice data one way or the other to tell us if this is, a, is worth doing in the future. Yeah, and Dr. Bendel, you, you've recently published a trial looking at combination therapy. Yeah, this is, this is on behalf of many investigators that yeah. have been looking at... We'll, we'll uh, give you all the credit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> that have been looking at a PD-L1 inhibitor, which is a, which is a different type of checkpoint inhibitor in sure. combination with bevacizumab, and that data has been, initial data has been published in Abstract Board and in Presentation, where we've looked at clinical safety about trying to combine these two together. Will we see something that we weren't expecting? And certainly, what we've seen is, is that you can give these agents safely together. And there's certainly early clinical data, so it's just suggesting that there may be benefit to doing this. And I, and I know Dr. Herbst is, is running a study that's, that's looking at this as well, e using other, other agents too. Right, that and, and we've been very impressed by the bevacizumab combos with the drug atezolizumab, formerly known as MPDL 3280A. But, but we are seeing, you know, again, it's hard to tell from single arm trials if, you know, right. they're randomized. Yeah. But certainly in renal cancer, it makes a lot of sense. That's a tumor that's driven by VEGF, but, you know, certainly in lung cancer and some GI malignancies. So I think it's very compelling. And, and we're running a trial now, and several others are involved, uh, looking at pembrolizumab, which is a PD-1 inhibitor, plus the ramacirumab, uh, in three tumor types, um, lung, gastric, and bladder, or uh, sort of broad genitourinary cancers. And again, it's still early. You know, the first thing you have to do is look at combined toxicities. Can, right. can you give it? But I think that it's a very compelling thought because when you look at why patients are resistant to immune therapies, it is because of you got, you're not getting the, the T cells to the tumor. Right. Helena, you, you have some Sure. Comments? Along the combination um, strategy lines and, you know, outside of uh, VEGFR2, HER2 is one of the mm -hmm. sort of biggest targets in gastric. And what makes VEGF inhibition appealing that by and large it's a very well tolerated uh, intervention. Patients mm -hmm. do well, you know, although there is some risk associated with hypertension and bleeding, it's very manageable. And so you can build on that strategy by combination therapies. And uh, we have a trial going, you know, starting now for to explore a combination of VEGFR2 inhibition with HER2 based on our preclinical mm -hmm. data. Uh, showing a strong synergy and the duration of response uh, would be higher. Again, because you're getting, you could see it as a drug delivery system right. as well, improving right. uh, permeation. But Roy, I'm um, just kind of thinking about this. Is there any reason to suspect um, toxicities would be an issue with combining these drugs, knowing what, what we know about each drug um, independently? Um, not offhand. 
but, 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 but you never know. You have know. to do the studies, right. right. Yeah. And yeah. Of course, you know, in lung cancer, we've always been worried about issues with bleeding, you know, right. with, with these inhibitors. With the immune therapies, we worry most about pneumonitis, and you know, could, could there be some combined activity, perhaps? Um, you know, and, and again, I guess it also depends on are using a small molecule to inhibit uh, angiogenesis or an antibody. There could be some interactions. Um, but, but no, I think, you know, what I'm, I'm very excited about is here we have, you know, data on how anti-angiogenic therapies work. We've known that for a long time. We have reasons that are beginning to emerge why immune therapies are either not, uh, not, not active, so primary resistance or acquired resistance that might develop. Right. That's actually a huge area, Mark, the fact that people are getting immune therapies and they benefit and then they, they stop benefit. Right. You know, now, you know, a few years into this now, we're starting to all see that. Right. So, you know, we're looking for combinations that are, are going to be tolerated that can perhaps overcome that resistance. So right now it's still a bit of speculation, uh, some preclinical data, but it's certainly there are trials important uh, to do. The one thing that we're trying to do at, at our place at, at Smile Cancer Hospital at Yale is try to include biopsies. I'm sure the others are doing the same thing. So really understand why these things are Repeat working or not. Repeat biopsies. Repeat biopsies. Yeah, so, yeah. so if in fact our hypothesis is true that we are getting more T cells, uh, into the tumor. Let's prove that. Yeah. And, and you actually don't even have to prove that in the combo trials. We can just look at trials where people are getting the, the, the agents, like the big phase three trial that you ran, Eddie. You could perhaps find some of the samples from that study and, and try, to, to try to understand that and see before and after did, did, did the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes change in some way, both in quantity and character. One thing I would like to say really quickly is in terms of safety signals. Mm -hmm. So certainly we haven't seen anything in combination with the anti-angiogenic antibodies and the immune right. therapies, but I think I think Roy brought up a very important point is the t small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors have a very different toxicity profile and may have some overlap. For instance, there could be potential liver toxicities with the small molecule tyrosine and kinase inhibitors that might interact with potential hepatotoxicity from immune agents. So I think that you know, outside of a clinical trial, I wouldn't put those right. two. Right, I was alluding to that. It'll be presented at a meeting uh, at some point soon, um, but, but yeah, small molecules, you know, Oh, not, not, not always specific. They can have a, an on and off target toxicities. I do think the experiment has to be done. I would not right. do this. I would not try this at home. Outside, you're right, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> with, without adult supervision. Yeah, right? yeah. not, not yeah. yet. Yeah. <laughs> so Manish, your perspective on, on, on this area? Yeah, so you know, I agree with what has been said already. I think that um, the nice thing about antiangenic therapy is that they have broad activity. They uh, can augment chemotherapy. They can affect the immune infiltrate and improve uh, the activity of checkpoint inhibitors. They, um, you know, have multiple effects that um, are beneficial from an anti-cancer standpoint. One thing I wanted to come back to with regard to what Eddie said in lung cancer and the approval of ramucirumab in the second line setting. So in colon cancer, um, it's been demonstrated that continued anti-angiogenic blockade from first to second line therapy is beneficial. That was based on the TML study and another uh, study as well. Um, and is there data like that in lung cancer? So the data is not necessarily um, specifically on continued therapy. So there were uh, a percentage of patients who were on the REVEL trial who had received prior uh, angiogenesis inhibition with bevacizumab. And uh, so that is a group that was included, um, and that group was evaluated, although um, it was only a subset of the trial. So, um, so we don't necessarily have analogous trials where large numbers of patients were treated with an angiogenesis inhibitor in the frontline setting and then evaluated subsequently um, in, in a, a rigorous fashion. In colon cancer, the um, hazard ratio is about 8.8, .8, so about a 20% benefit with continuing anti-angiogenic therapy. And that gets to the preclinical data that uh, others know about with regard to the, you know, once you stop the blockade, you get a sprouting effect of the neoangiogenesis, and that may, you know, sort of increase the tumor growth. So, you know, I think that's a very interesting concept as well. Yeah, that, that actually leads into the next question I was going to uh, ask, and that is...